In addition to being a stammering researcher, I'm also a person who stammers. And I want to start by making a few observations from my own stammering journey. As I've grown older, the way that I stammer has gradually changed. My stammering symptoms have become less severe and I no longer view stammering as an enemy that I have to fight. If I look back over my experiences of stammering over the years, it's now very evident to me that the way that I react physically and emotionally in the various speaking situations that I encounter in my everyday life depends to a large extent on my beliefs, including my beliefs about stammering, my beliefs about how other people view my stammering, and my beliefs about how fluently I should be able to speak. These beliefs have developed gradually over time as a result of experiences of stammering in different situations and as a result of what I've been told or taught about stammering. When I look back on my past beliefs about stammering, I can see that although many of them were perfectly reasonable, some of them were unhelpful in as much as they undermined my confidence. And some of them had a profoundly negative impact upon how I felt about myself. The goal of cognitive therapy is to teach us to look at what we currently believe about stammering and identify any unhelpful beliefs that we may hold and to replace them with beliefs that are helpful. So what does cognitive therapy involve? Well, the first task of cognitive therapy is to identify what exactly we do believe about stammering and to investigate how and why those beliefs arose and to examine evidence primarily from our own lives and experiences as to whether or not those beliefs are reasonable and whether or not they're helpful. An underlying presumption of cognitive therapy is that if we can identify what we believe and question those beliefs and the evidence upon which they're based, especially if we focus on recent evidence from our own lives, it'll become clear to us that at least some of our current beliefs about our stammering are inaccurate and unhelpful. And as it becomes clear to us that some of our beliefs are inaccurate and unhelpful, those beliefs will spontaneously change and will be replaced by beliefs that are more helpful. And so why might cognitive therapy be useful to people who stammer? Well, cognitive therapy has been successfully used for many conditions that have a cognitive component to them. That is to say, conditions that are influenced by people's beliefs, including phobias, social anxiety, and eating disorders. And similarly, stammering also has a strong cognitive component to it, in as much as our beliefs about stammering strongly influence how we react when we enter speaking situations, and how easily we can employ speech therapy techniques and how positive we feel about our performance. The experiences of stammerers who have undergone cognitive therapy suggest that we can identify and change our unhelpful beliefs about stammering relatively easily and that many people who stammer are able to make those changes on their own, in their own time, without needing access to a therapist. What evidence is there that cognitive therapy can be useful to people who stammer? Over the past 20 or so years, a lot of research has been carried out to investigate whether or not cognitive therapy may be helpful for people who stammer. Much of this research has been carried out by the Australian Stuttering Research Centre, the ASRC, who have focused on a specific form of cognitive therapy known as Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, or CBT. The ASRC's findings have consistently shown that Cognitive Behavioural Therapy can significantly reduce the amount of negative emotions that people who stammer experience in the various speaking situations they encounter. Their findings have also consistently shown that stammerers who suffer from social anxiety or social phobia respond significantly better to a mixture of CBT and speech therapy 
compared to if they just receive CBT in isolation or speech therapy in isolation. One of the most likely reasons why cognitive therapy makes speech therapy work better is because it helps us to stay calm in speaking situations and not become overwhelmed by emotions that then interfere with our ability to successfully employ whatever speech therapy techniques we may have learned. So what then is an unhelpful belief? Well, broadly speaking, with regard to stammering, unhelpful beliefs can be categorised into two categories. Beliefs that reduce our confidence in our ability to communicate effectively, and beliefs that, are redu uh, and beliefs that reduce our feeling of well-being. The first step in cognitive therapy is to identify as many of our beliefs about stammering as possible, without trying to decide at that point whether or not they're helpful. A good starting point is to ask ourselves the following questions and write down our answers. What do I think caused my stammer? Do I think it was anyone's fault? Do I think it was my fault? What impact does my stammering have on my life, including my daily activities, my career, my relationships, my self-esteem, self etc.? And how does my stammering affect how, how other people interact with me? How would my life be different if I didn't stammer? Does my stammering bring me any benefits? The second step in cognitive therapy is to review those beliefs in light of our recent experiences and current knowledge of stammering. This step is vitally important because many of our beliefs about our stammering may have developed a long time ago, at a time in our lives when the challenges and situations faced were quite different to those that we face today. So with respect to each of our beliefs about stammering, it's important to ask ourselves, what current evidence do I have that continues to support this belief? Is there any evidence that suggests this belief may no longer be reasonable or helpful? I've listed here some of the most common reasons why people develop unhelpful beliefs. The first three, jumping to conclusions too quickly, all or nothing thinking, and catastrophizing, are essentially thinking styles that are normal for young children. And in young children, these thinking styles fulfill a very important and necessary protective role. But normally, as we mature, they're replaced by more subtle thinking styles, which allow us to perceive the world more in terms of shades of grey and to accept and feel comfortable with uncertainty. However, if our childhood and upbringing has been traumatic and filled with insecurities, which is often the case in people who stammer, we may have failed to move on from these simple thinking styles. And if this is the case, we're likely to have accumulated many unhelpful beliefs as a result. Here are some examples of unhelpful beliefs that are commonly held by people who stammer. Some of these are completely false, whereas others may constitute exaggerations or oversimplifications of the reality of our situations. For example, consider the first one. If I stammer, people will reject me. Fear of rejection is a major problem for people who stammer, and such fear may lead us to avoid speaking or to avoid situations in which we think we're likely to stammer. Moreover, if we're afraid that a person may reject us because of our stammering, we're likely to stammer more severely with that person, so it may become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Of course, it may be true that some people will reject me because I stammer, especially if I stammer severely, but not everyone will reject me. And the best way to find the people who won't reject me because of my stammer is to allow myself to stammer and not always to try to hide it. The second example, I should always try to be completely fluent. 
is a belief that is not only unhelpful but also completely false. The reality is that although some people are more fluent than others, nobody is completely fluent. And in fact, research shows that speech that contains some disfluencies is sometimes easier for listeners to understand and to pay attention to than speech that is spoken completely, fluency, uh, completely fluently. Of course, we don't want to be severely disfluent, but we do need to allow ourselves to be disfluent and to stammer a bit. Trying to be completely fluent will just turn us into nervous wrecks and ultimately will increase our, dis our tendency to, f to stammer. The third unhelpful belief is it's always better to hide the fact that I stammer. This unhelpful belief is particularly common amongst people who only stammer mildly and who have the ability to avoid stammering by changing words around and by other tricks. If you're a mild stammerer, it, it may well be possible for you to successfully hide your stammering, but you may end up paying a high price for doing so. For a start, listeners are very perceptive and are likely to notice that you're hesitating and often not saying the words that are in your mind. Because they don't see you stammering, they're likely to wonder why you're changing your words and they may conclude that you're trying to hide something. They may conclude that you're not telling the truth or not being completely open. There's also a danger that having successfully portrayed yourself as a fluent speaker, you then start to fear that people will find out that you stammer. The stammering may then become a big secret that you feel you have to hide. And every time you're in a difficult speaking situation, the fear arises that you may not be able to hide it and that people may find out. This is what's known as covert stammering. And although covert stammerers may stammer less or even not at all, they're often plagued by feelings of shame and guilt and fear of speaking and being found out. The reality is that although very occasionally it may be helpful to hide the fact that I stammer, in the vast majority of situations, it's far better not to hide it. The fourth unhelpful belief is, because I stammer, I'll never be able to find a partner. This belief is surprisingly common amongst people who stammer, and it may reflect the fact that many of us have lived through painful experiences of rejection. And it's understandable that such experiences don't leave us feeling very happy about our stammering. But to conclude from such experiences that as long as I stammer, I will never be able to find a partner is not realistic, nor is it helpful. Of course, our stammering may put some people off us. And if we feel bad because of our stammering, that bad feeling may also put some people off us. But there are definitely also a substantial number of people who are not put off by stammering. We just have to find them. And again, our best way of finding such people is to learn how to stammer openly without feeling in any way bad or inadequate about it. The fifth unhelpful belief is, because I stammer, I'll never be able to be happy. This unhelpful belief, which is also very common amongst people who stammer, arises because of a fund fundamental misunderstanding about the nature of happiness and suffering. The misunderstanding is a belief that it's the things that happen to us in our lives that make us happy or sad. The reality is that our experiences of happiness and sadness do not arise as a direct result of the things that happen to us. Despite how it may seem on the surface, if one studies the nature of happiness and sadness in more depth, it will become apparent that these two emotions come and go in our lives quite independently of the, of the things that happen to us. And the reality is that even if our stammering were to completely disappear, 
happiness and sadness will continue to come and go in our lives just as they do now. Becoming free from stammering will not make us substantially more happy. With regard to happiness and sadness, the best outcome that we can achieve in our lives is to accept that these two emotions do come and go and will continue to come and go. In this way, we can learn at least to be at peace with them and then at least we'll be free from the sadness that results from trying unsuccessfully to be free from sadness. Many people who stammer believe that their stammering is their own fault. Such people are likely to feel bad about themselves and about, and about their stammering. And such feelings and beliefs may make it harder for them to learn how to manage it. In the past, in many cultures, it was widely believed that people who stammer do so because they're not trying hard enough or because they're in some way undesirable or bad. But for more than 50 years, almost all research that has been carried out into the causes of stammering has very clearly shown that in the vast majority of cases, people who stammer have inherited a genetic predisposition to stammering and or have started to stammer after one or more traumatic experiences. We don't choose our genetic makeup, nor do we choose to be traumatized. So the beliefs that our stammering is our own fault and that because of our stammering we must be bad people are just simply false. The more you study the causes of stammering, the stronger your faith will become that it is not your fault and the less your stammering will impact your sense of self-esteem. Having spoken a lot about the false beliefs that many stammerers hold, I want to mention a couple of facts about stammering that it's helpful to understand. The first is that although as people who stammer, we all have some things in common, we're also all very different to one another. And the difficulties that other stammerers struggle with are sometimes very different to our own difficulties. In particular, some, but not all people who stammer, have an underlying physiological or anatomical condition that prevents them from being able to speak clearly. Some, but not all, people who stammer have unrealistically high expectations about how well they should be able to speak. And some, but not all, people who stammer live in cultures or social environments that are intolerant of stammering. So advice that may help one person who stammers may not help another. The second fact about stammering that it's useful to remember is that as we grow older, our speech and language capacities generally increase, as does our social status. So for example, as children, we may have had poor speech motor control and poor language skills. We certainly have relatively little ability to control our speaking environment. We almost certainly also had limited access to information about stammering. We had a relatively low social status because all children do. In contrast, as adults, we generally have better speech motor control abilities and language abilities than we did when we were young. We have more control over our speaking environment. We have more access to information. And we have a higher social status. So it's quite possible and, and indeed likely that many of the factors that may have contributed to our stammering when we were younger no longer apply to us. It's therefore useful in cognitive therapy to consider the factors that may have contributed to the onset of our stammering early in our lives and to ask ourselves whether or not they still apply. Almost certainly, some of them do not. Finally, it's important to bear in mind that cognitive therapy has some drawbacks and is not suitable for everyone. 
It's not so useful for young children, although it can be very useful for their parents. And I highly recommend that the parents of children who stammer do as much as they reasonably can to learn about the nature of stammering. To benefit from cognitive therapy, one needs to have the time, the space and the capacity to be able to study and to think about things. One also needs to be relatively free from strong feelings of emotion. Because of this, cognitive therapy is not always helpful for people suffering from depression. Stammerers who suffer from depression may first need to wait for their depression to lift in order to be able to benefit from it. In the meantime, they may benefit more from mindfulness and meditation. And for people with severe stammering, research findings suggest that cognitive therapy alone does not help reduce the severity of their disfluencies. However, they can benefit from a combination of cognitive therapy and fluency techniques as taught in traditional speech therapy and in our online course. The great thing about cognitive therapy for stammering is that we can do at least some of it on our own, simply by reading about the nature of stammering and developing a more accurate and helpful understanding of it. It may help if you have access to a good speech therapist or psychotherapist, but access to a therapist is not always necessary. Over the internet, you can access many excellent online resources which provide a lot of accurate, up-to-date information about stammering and about cognitive therapy. So start studying. Read books about stammering and about cognitive therapy. Talk about these topics with other stammerers. Join a local self-help group or start one if none exists near you. And sign up for free online courses. And you might even want to consider becoming a speech therapist or a psychologist yourself and specialising in stammering. After all, these are professions that people who stammer may be particularly well suited to due to their wealth of personal experience. In this final slide, I've listed some information sources that you might like to check out. Thank you for listening.